All right, we're back once again. This is Father Demetrius hanging out here with Brother Will. So, before we start, I think I want to start by saying, is it your Siri or mine? Mine. Okay, that was, all right then. <laughs> all right, that was not what I was going to say, but all right then. Um... No, I wanted to start by saying uh, probably a spoiler warning for this episode. Mm. Because Brother Will and I both recently went ch and checked out the new movie Menu. The Menu, yeah. The Menu. And there's definitely a couple things in that that I think are worth talking about. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think we should start off by talking about... We go to the movies together quite a bit. And, that we uh, do. And... Uh, I have a notoriously poor track record of picking good movies. Yeah, you are just downright horrible at picking movies. Yeah. I mean like it's bad. It's like, bad. I don't I don't think I've picked a good one yet. I honestly don't. It's it's been cuz we went to that like Mary Ghost one, that like Amityville thing. We I don't know. Oh, the M. Night Shyamalan one, old. Oh, like, yeah. On the, the beach. The beach one. That was really bad. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe I have like a um, a subconscious natural um, affinity for bad movies. Like they're like they're like they still need to be loved. Well, you were a fan of what was it? Room 41 or whatever. Like the worst movie. The room. Oh, the room. Yeah. Well, there are some movies that are so bad that they have charm. Yes. This was worse than that. <laughs> uh the room yeah is a notoriously bad movie and uh, in the last few years james franco mm -hmm. and his brother dave franco they were like the room is like a cult people love it you know yeah they watch it every year there's the, the guy who made it um his name escapes me now but he still like tours the movie like yeah. around the country for like these for these people That's that just Love yeah. the movie. Yes, yeah, like Rocky Horror Picture Show or um, what's the other one I'm blanking on right now? The Princess Bride. Right, right. And uh, so they made a movie that's like a fictional retelling of when the original guy made the movie. I heard about that. So yeah. you get some snippets of the like of the movie itself, plus like behind the scenes stuff. Seth Rogen's in it. <laughs> that was a really good movie. It was called the D the Disaster Artist. Yes, yes, I remember when that came out. Remember when that came out? And this it's it's this guy who like nobody knows where he's actually from. He has this accent, like he sounds like he's from like Transylvania. Mm -hmm. He always wears sunglasses. They have no idea how he got the money to make the movie. He got like five million dollars to make the movie or something. They have no idea where it came from. And uh that's like his whole thing. He made like one of the worst movies of all time. And yet we're talking about it. And yet we're talking about it. You know, some you gotta be you gotta be known for something. Yep. But, um, but yeah, the menu. Uh, if if no one has seen any of the previews or anything, it stars uh, Ralph Fiennes who played Voldemort in Harry Potter, and uh, he plays this uh, very accomplished chef. He's, mm -hmm. he's kind of a world renowned chef, and he invites people to these very exclusive dinner parties. In yeah, this it's, kind of remote area. It reminds me of there's actually uh, a restaurant in the city here, Nihon, Nihon, Ni, Niho, Nisho. Ni. It's it's basically the same thing. It's a very very high end sushi chef slash Japanese chef who does seatings for anywhere between eight and eighteen people, and that's it. And he runs. He picks the menu. He determines what you will eat, and it's basically a scenario of you give him money and you're happy you get to come. Right. Yeah. Um, what is that? Niho? Nihon? Nisho? I know there's that documentary of Gy Gyro Dreams of Sushi, and that was about. I, th I don't think that was in the U.S. though. I think it was in like Japan, and this guy had a like a six seat sushi restaurant that was like booked like three years in advance, that sort of thing. You know? Yeah. Um. So 
Ralphian plays the chef. Exclusive dinner parties in this kind of remote area in the U.S. And uh, the film kind of begins centering around uh, this guy who's taking uh, a woman out on a date to mm-hmm. the to the dinner party, and he's kind of like an uber fan of this chef. Yes. Uh, but it's a horror movie, and of course I thought... Would you call it, it horror or like thriller, like psychological? Yeah, maybe it's closer to thriller. Because like I, I didn't see it so much as horror. Like there wasn't like a lot of jump scares. There wasn't a lot of like stuff like crazy eight balls. There's no monsters. I mean, yeah. sure, you know, Jeremy's mess was a quick eight ball. But if you watched the previews, you knew something was going on. Yeah. And I thought that it was direction it was going is like okay eventually like they're going to be eating like human flesh or something right and that was not the direction it was going no but the the whole movie kind of turned out to be a kind of critique on foodie culture yep especially like very high-end some might say pretentious you know foodie foodie type of people yep um well the main character tyler the guy that brings the date you know that's sort of his stick so to speak you know he's this you know foodie foodie who knows all the ways which things are done yet can't do them it's like he knows like this uses a panko this uses that this uses this is how you do it he knows the theoretical but he doesn't know the actual way practical like he can't practically do it he's kind of a know-it-all in terms of right like you said the theoretical Right, and he kind of like he's, he he likes to try to impress the woman he's with with all his food knowledge that he can't actually do in real life. Right, it reminds me of like you know I've met some people that are like huge like wine people or whiskey people, and yet you know I got a buddy back home who literally owns a distillery. Like he went legit. He went from being like backyard type dude to going legit, and it's like all right, yeah, you think you know what's in a whiskey? How how are you making your living? Uh, and that that's sort of who I thought of when I thought of that Tyler mm-hmm. character was, you know, the guy that, you know, again, he knows the theoretical. He can dissect a lot of stuff. He's developed a palette that he at least thinks is legit. Yet he can't do it. Uh, you know? Yeah. And, and, and so the movie kind of begins with him and it's, it's the sort of movie where, you think one thing about the people there and then you find out more about them and it becomes a little bit darker. Mm-hmm. Um, so that there's one couple there and the woman who's his date, you find out was not his original date. Right. Something happened. And I don't know if she canceled on him or canceled, broke up. And so he brought this uh, other woman who it turned out was, she was a pro. Yeah. 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 She was a lady in the night. Yeah. That's she was right. A date for hire. That's right. And um, so she she's kind of annoyed the whole time because people are talking to her kind of in a nasty way. And mm-hmm. she's not really, uh, she sees the environment as like very fake and pretentious. Mm-hmm. Um, then you have a, an older couple who don't really seem to be getting along. Mm-hmm. You find out why later. You have a group of like finance bros yep. that you find out are kind of uh, involved in fraud. Yep. Um, then you have a, kind of a... Uh, a washed up actor played by John Leguizamo. Yeah. Who's with a younger woman and he's, he's, his he's production ha- assistant, his, his manager. That's right. And he's trying to sort of hang on to his last sort of bit of fame and, mm-hmm. you know, um, I don't know. Maybe you can food critics. Oh yeah. You have the two food critics, the woman and the man and they're, it's the stereotype of the pretentious food critic. Right, you know? like seeking things to be wrong, to be wrong. Like, I love that scene where she's like, oh, look, the sauce is broken for this, you know, $1,200 a plate or whatever. You wouldn't, you know, you the sauce should be perfect. And so the chef literally just sends out a whole bowl of the sauce. Like, is this broken too? Yeah, yeah. But, it's, the, it's the people that could never be satisfied. Right. right. You can give them the best food in the world, cooked perfectly, and they'd have something to say about it. Right. And I, and I love that that trolling, too. Like, the breadless bread course. Oh, yeah. Where, like, he does this whole thing on, like, he gives all these, like, toppings for bread. And there's obscene, every course at this restaurant, he goes into obscene, and I mean obscene detail, as to where it was sourced from, how it was made, how it was prepared, what makes it special. 
And that's sort of like, again, like the theme, there's a theme you're supposed to try and figure out for the menu. And uh, one of them, one of the courses, one of the appetizer courses, so to speak, was breadless bread. So instead of getting bread, you get the toppings for bread, you know, like a very high end butter, a very like this cream sauce, which the one lady, the, uh, the, the um, critic said was broken, etc. But no bread. And then you find out this very high end, obscenely rare grain bread was used and donated to like a food kitchen or whatever. Right. And, uh, you know, sort of a commentary on wealth and equality and all this stuff. And right. Right. Yeah. And, and you kind of come to find out over the course of the movie, a lot of it is about it's, it's a skewering pun intended mm -hmm. of this high end foodie culture where it's become, uh, you, 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 you learn so much about the food and you, you talk about it in a certain way and you, you break it down so much and analyze it so much that you, you take the joy out of eating, just eating it. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're not actually enjoying a meal. You're enjoying the bragging rights of being able to eat the meal. Right. And that's one thing like with the finance bros, you know, like they, they, they knew they were putting it on a corporate dime and you later find out that their boss is like the silent backer for the restaurant, et cetera. You know, but it's this idea of like, we're just going to get wasted and like, you know, and again, if you're, if you're eating, you know, like basically the equivalent of a four or five star Michelin chef restaurant, you shouldn't be getting wasted because, you know, that should be a once in a lifetime experience, right. which again is like with the older couple. That's one thing I found not funny, but interesting when you find out like, you know, this was like their 12th or 13th time. Right. And, you know, and you can see that it, you know, that plays out as something that plays out and they're the still movie. miserable yeah. right yeah and they can't even remember a single course that they had before right and what what does the chef say at one point he said don't eat it taste it yes right you know yeah. do not eat anything tonight taste right savor it yeah and you find out late that's kind of they should savor it because and this is really the big spoiler is that that you find out maybe what halfway through the movie, yeah, that the plan is for all of them to die. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone in the, you know, all the cooks in the kitchen, the, the chef himself, everyone eating, all the diners, etc. The plan is all, for all of them to die, and it's sort of like for for uh, Fien's character, the whole thing becomes a kind of art project. Right. Right. You, you have to savor this food so much. It's going to be so good because it's literally going to be your last meal. Right. And and I did like, though, like, again, like, I loved, and I know I mentioned this to you earlier, though, but I, I love how, like, all the diners were handpicked. Yeah. You know, and they all have a secret that gets revealed. They all have a a, a deep dark that comes back to haunt them. You know, and I, I actually love how he revealed a lot of that because he did a, like a like a taco uh, tortilla type thing where oh, he yeah. made the tortillas and he used a laser engraver to burn in like the blackmail type stuff onto the tortilla. So like for the food critic, it was restaurant locations of places where she gave like hyper negative reviews and where they like shut down like that. Yeah. For the finance bros, it was, you know, the books that showed that they were cooking the books and embezzling millions of money for like a crypto pump and dump, as right. they say, where you, you know, if you don't know what a pump and dump is, it's when you buy a lot of stock, you hype up a lot of stock, you know, you pump it up. And then as people are buying it, you just dump all your shares and just tank it. But you sold at the high, so you save. Right. Um, You know, and you know, the couple that was always there and X, Y, Z. And you find out that the other one who actually knew that that people were going to die is Tyler, the one who brought the escort. Right. Who had no clue that, you know. Any of this was going to happen. Right. And, and, and she rightfully is extremely upset because he knew that she was going to die and he didn't tell her. Right. 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 Be it was more about his, the pleasure that he experienced. Right, right, because, and he was asked about it, and she said, so why didn't you, I was like, well, because you don't take single seatings. 
<laughs> that's <laughs> right. Oh, right. And that's another element of like all these rules around, you know, the high food culture and how you're supposed to consume it and how you're, you know, the environment and blah, blah, blah. Right. right. But um, I did love how, again, it basically, to me, it seemed like a commentary, not just on food culture, but on culture in general. The idea that like, you never know what action you're going to do, what word you're going to say, what thing you're going to do is going to have a consequence that you can't get out of. Yeah. It's going to create something that's going to just, whether you realize it in the moment or not, going to lock you in and might end up leading to your destruction. Yeah. Like the food critic, you know, she was doing arguably her job. I think it comes across in the movie, though, that she looks for problems to like be like that Gordon Ramsay type person. She's like the type of person who like really, she wants to throw her weight around. Exactly. Yeah. She wants to be the kingmaker or the breaker. Yeah. And, you know, you see that too, like with the, with the chef, you know, like you eventually, uh, the one main character, the, the girl, Maria, no, what's her name? Margot. Margo, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, Margo. She ends up sneaking into his private cottage, and you see that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's creepy. His being the chefs. The chefs, yeah. yeah. Um, but one thing we find out is that he was rated, like, the best fast food burger guy, and that got him, or employee of the month or whatever for the fast food, and that got him to think about being a chef, and then that, you know, that one act of being like so like you're the best hamburger maker in the state propelled him to the career where he was the best of the best but utterly miserable right and then in the photo i think it's maybe the only time or one of the few times where he actually smiles in the movie where he's seen smiling he right? smiles one other time is it before no uh, what's it what's the other time when huge spoiler here but when margo sends the food back and says i'm still hungry and he goes all right what do you want well, what do you have he's like everything he goes i want a cheeseburger oh that's right yeah not some deconstructed cheeseburger not some new take just a good old-fashioned greasy american cheeseburger with fries right and as he's putting the meat down and pressing the patty on the griddle he smiles that's right and he's 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 connected back to his sort of uh, formal joyful self, right? Yeah. The simplicity of just making a burger and knowing that you're the best burger maker around, right? And this thing that you know he thought he was supposed to chase. I'm I'm going to become the best chef in the world, the most you know exclusive whatever. Yep. Right. The 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 brass ring that he was chasing that he thought would make him even more happy actually turned out to be the opposite. It turned right. out to make him miserable. Right, and I love that scene with the sous chef. Yeah, the sous chef actually takes his own life in the movie. But he's asked flat out, you know, he lists all the credentials the sous chef has. And like, and then he's like, you know, Jeremy, having worked with me now, do you want my life? Not the fame, not the name recognition, my life. And he's no chef. As he realizes the immense insanity of drive right that this guy was consumed by to all be, the pressure how detail oriented you have to be and mm -hmm. right how flawless everything has to be at the top right because of people like the guests who will nitpick every little thing right and the, and the whole the way that uh ralph Fien's character the chef character runs his kitchen it's very militaristic yes right so uh a new course is instituted by him clapping. He claps. Yes. And then all the, the chefs kind of take formation. And it's very militaristic. Yes. Right? There's no there's no joy there. It's very right. kind of it's colorless. Sterile. Yeah, sterile. That's a good that's a good you know, word. It's sterile. It's it's not what you expect. Like, you know, like I've heard stories, you know, uh, one of our monks, Father Joseph, is is a professional chef. Connor Institute of America, like legit chef. And the stories I hear from the kitchen, you know, it's not, even at high-end kitchens, it's not that. It's not this nice, calm, front-of-the-house look. No, it's it's absolute chaos. It's pans being thrown. It's curse words and slurs being yelled at each other in three languages. Right. It's not this organized order thing that's shown here. Right. But I think that was, again, shown to just show the immense control 
that that chef demanded and that insanity. Right. Uh. And his hand, you know, his hand was so tight around all of it that squeezed all the joy out of it. Yes. You know? Um, Because I'm sure even in those high-pressure environments, like working in a kitchen like that, there must be something to that. I would imagine it's sort of similar to like, you know, like a high-paced environment, like working on the floor of the stock market or something. Mm -hmm. Like, Yeah, it's, it's insane and stressful, but there's something that keeps you coming back to it. Like you get like an adrenaline high almost out of it. Right. You know, or, you know, think of like surgeons or anything, any situation where like you have to be the best of the best or is literally life and death. Or like in the case of the stock market, you make the sale, you make billions, you miss the sale, you lose millions. You know, I mean, think about like, again, like, you know, it's cliche, but you know, the images from the 1920s, when the stock market crashed that time, leading up to the Great Depression, you know, brokers literally jumped out of windows because of the stress of that job. Right. But but you're right. There is that that fire, that Wolf of Wall Street insanity, that drive to, you know, all right, I made two point six million today. Let's do three tomorrow. Right, right, right. Never it's a, that's another thing. It's like it's never enough. Exactly. It will never satiate you. Which again is why I see it the whole movie as a commentary, not just on foodie culture, but on culture. You know, if we think about the way society's become, you know, I mean, think about how many of our boys pick a college, you know, and I don't mean this to be mean to those who have done this, but who pick a college, not because of the degree they want to get from there, that it's the best place to become, you know, X, Y, Z, but because they like the school. The name recognition. The name recognition. The reputation. Yeah. This stuff that, yeah, it's important, but ultimately doesn't matter. No. Right. You know, what? the reason you're supposed to go to college isn't to go to college. It's to get that return on investment. It's not to go and chill for four years. It's to, you know, get something for the future. Right, right. You know, I know somebody actually, uh, they got into Harvard Law. And uh, when they were asked what they wanted to do, they got into Seton Hall Law and Harvard Law. And uh, uh, to the credit of Harvard, you know, Harvard asked them, you know, what, what do you plan to, to do? And uh, the person goes, well, I'd, I'd really like to be like a public defender. I'd really like to help people and do like criminal, you know, criminal defense defense work. Uh-huh. And the interview for Harvard Law then looked at him then don't come to us. <laughs> like, if you got into other schools, do that because you will never pay back your loans. Right. Doing that type of work. You know, you want to do corporate law, you want to do business law, you want to do foreign, like investment law, stuff like that. Come to us. Right. Your ROI will be insane. If you want to do that and help people, which the person's like, I, I love that that's what you want to do. But go to scene all. Yeah. Because the debt to what you're going to do, well, you won't go insane. Right. And that's something, I th- you know, that our, our college admissions people talked about last year. Because I think the, the group of colleges we sent our seniors to last year, uh, there were some new names of uh, those colleges. Yeah. Of colleges. And they said there's a real push of, you know, okay, yes, these schools are great, but are they offering what? you want you know what you want right you know, if you want to study marine biology you know maybe uh nebraska is not the best place to do that exactly <laughs> you know? um again i i knew a guy he went to gannon university because he wanted to do underwater archaeology and they had a program for that you know the ivies didn't you know he had the option between going i think it was to south carolina university of south carolina or gannon like if he wanted a top program not top college but top program in his field right you know it's like me I, I wanted to be a teacher so i went to iup indiana university of pennsylvania which began its life as indiana teachers college uh they still teach very well like when pennsylvania changed their social studies certification program our college refused to cut corners so even though they split the program into two separate uh social studies certs our college is like, no, you're getting both. Yeah. You get a free credit elective. Uh-huh. I got to pick a credit. 
Everything else was dictated. You will have this history class, this history class, this sociology class, this psychology class, this, 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 this. And they maxed out on the credits because there's a cap in PA at least, and I think it's nationwide, as to how many credits a bachelor's can have versus a master's versus X, Y, Z. But again, I went, I wanted to be a teacher and they were known as teachers. In fact, it helped me when I was at Seton Hall and I was having trouble actually transferring my certs into New Jersey because I wasn't actively teaching on them because I was a novice, all that stuff. You know, the actual, um, the guys at Seton Hall were actually like, okay, I'll handle it for you. I'll take care of it. I was like, really? I was like, yeah. Like, I know IUP. I know the reputation. And if the state's still giving us trouble, I'll just certify you through Jersey. Like as if you're one of our grads. Like, you can do that? Yes. I'll transfer your credits in. They're, <laughs> they're, they're not bad credits. It's yeah. like, I, I know the program. And so it's like, sweet. There we go. But yeah. I, I do think, you know, because that's one thing. Like, again, like take college. Take anything. You know, even a little action can have those long lasting consequences. Yeah. You know, think about all the debate this summer over loan forgiveness. You know, you signed your name. Well, well, I was only 19. I didn't know that that would haunt me for the rest, you know, for the next 25 years. Okay. You still signed your name. Right. And I think, again, that's one thing I took away from the movie is I do think we are increasingly becoming a culture and a society that doesn't think Ahead. through the possible consequences. Uh, you it's know? just what do I want right now? I need right. to satiate that now. Right. Or think about it later. Right. Or the, all right, we got a course correct. You know, I, I think often as a like culture, whether it's secularly or even in the church, much like a canoe. Again, if you've ever taken like a canoe um, or a raft, white rod of rafting, you know, like the middle schoolers, I go with them now almost every year. It's a half past two years. Um, we go canoeing and slash white water rafting in the Poconos here. And one thing you learn is if you overcorrect, then you got to frantically try to correct back. And you get this massive back and forth, and it takes a long time to level out again. You're no longer on the straight and narrow. Exactly. Yeah. And I think too often in society, we don't think about the consequences of a hard correction. And we don't realize that that's going to push back another hard correction. Right. You know, I was looking at, I was talking and thinking through it, and I looked up, um, did you ever see the, the website Social Blade? No. So what it does is it pulls analytics from YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, for like more bigger accounts, but it pulls like historic data. It lets you see a ballpark estimate. How quick is this person growing in popularity? How quick is this person dropping in popularity? Oh, I see. Stuff like that. And I was like, Somehow I got thinking about it and I went and I looked, you know, like the Harvey Weinstein stuff like that. Oh, I know what did it. I, I found out that that She Said movie was about the Harvey Weinstein thing. Yeah. And that got me thinking about Harvey Weinstein. And then I was like, you know what? Thinking about it. When that happened, the whole like Me Too, Believe All Women, you know, the regardless of evidence, Believe All Women came out and the whole Johnny Depp stuff started, that whole stuff. I was like, I don't remember ever hearing about like Andrew Tate or people like that before that. Mm. So I went back and I looked at Social Blade. You see about like six months after like the wine scene story. Oh, blow, it's like the pendulum goes to the other side. Exactly. Right. This like correction, correct back. Correction, correct back. So it's like Weinstein and all these guys that were accused of these sexual crimes. Mm -hmm. You know, all men are evil you know, toxic masculinity, et cetera. Right. And then here comes Andrew Tate saying, no, masculinity is awesome. And I'm going to show right. you what it, what it looks like. Yep. And now you have all these kind of young guys that are sort of devotees of. Exactly. Of I mean, line the, of thinking. there's a very large number of our boys. And again, I, I'm not saying I agree with it, but I'm saying I understand it. Who are taking like the, you know, strong, successful male movement, the better, better bachelor movement, the Sigma male movement, all these different like sort of like quasi male rights, men's rights, 
you know, like, I don't want to say toxic, but very traditional masculinity approach to stuff. Uh -huh. And, you know, that's becoming, I'm seeing it become more and more popular, at least with our upperclassmen. Yeah. And again, I'm not trying to make a judgment call on that. Like, I don't, I'm not in it. So, like, I don't, you know what I mean? Yeah. I see clips. Um, But that's one thing I, I see. Like, part of me sees that you go too far one way. Like, you don't keep it within, like, a rudder movement where you're just slightly moving the tip of that canoe, but you try to whip it around a rock. All of a sudden, now you're headed to the shore, and you got to whip it back. Right. And then, oh, wait, another rock. You got to right. whip it, you know. And I'm sure even prior to the Weinstein thing, that was a reaction to, I mean, how many stories you have to hear of women, um, you know, alleging or claiming assault and they don't get hurt or the whatever, right. the police don't investigate it. So right. even that Weinstein thing, it was, that, that was a reaction to something prior to that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Bill Cosby and, I mean, a lot of stuff. And again, I'm not saying these guys were, you know, like, I ain't gonna lie. I, I laughed pretty hard at the meme, you know, like, who would have thought that Al Bundy would turn out to be the better father when you compare <laughs> him to the Seven Heaven guy, Bill Crosby, yeah. and, uh, um, oh, I forget the other one they used in it. What show? It was Bill Cosby, Seventh Heaven, and... It wasn't Bob Saget. He never did anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you, you 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 didn't go to his stand up. Uh, I I did see his stand up at, <laughs> when I was at Syracuse. He came to do the stand up. It was the the dirtiest stand up I've ever heard. And I, I know like, Bob I, Saget. Really, you're not like your TV character. I've seen Ron White, and Ron White just drinks scotch and gets offensive. And yeah. Bob Saget was worse than Ron White. Oh yeah, yeah. Bob Saget was the dirtiest stand up I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. He was bad. He was bad. But anyway, but like, who would have thought that Al Bundy would have turned out to be like the the actual yeah. role model, <laughs> right? You know? Right. And he was like, I mean, to me, he was like everyone's dad, like in terms of like, yeah, I'm a dad. Like, what do you like? What do you want from me? You know, right? Like, he wasn't right. like he wasn't like angelic, but he also wasn't. Uh, uh, who's the curmudgeonly guy from uh, like uh, 70s, 80s? Uh, oh, um, I forget his name. But it's one of those sitcoms from the... Yeah, 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 yeah. He he, he had a toilet. He was always on the toilet. Um, Ralph. Not Ralph. Was it Ralph? I forget. Ah. Oh, that's going to bother me. And somebody's going to know it. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good way like, like chime in in the comments, guys. Like, <laughs> like, remind us who this is. But Al Bundy was kind of like, you know, he wasn't uh, Mr. Happy. He was just there being a dad, you know. Right. It was a very, to me, it was like a, a kind of a realistic portrait of, of fatherhood. You know, you're not always happy to be there. Yeah, it was, okay, it was all in the family. And it was, what was the main character's name? It was all in the family. Uh, yeah, it was Archie Bunker. Archie Bunker. That is it. Archie Bunker, yeah. Did somebody put that in the comments yet? <laughs> Like, comment, subscribe. <laughs> the way we feed the algorithm. That's right. But no, but right, like, and, and I ain't gonna lie, like some of the some of the one liners from from uh, Married with Children are, are still classic. Like, you know, like, do you miss me, Al? Every time so far. <laughs> or, uh, or a classic one that's used actually by that. Um, at least some of the clips I've seen some of the boys watching in the Sigma male movement is. You know, don't try to understand women. Women understand women, and they hate each other. <laughs> and I'm like, I know that line. That comes from Al Bundy. <laughs> yeah. But there's something to be said for that, you know, this, like the movements that you talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's, you know, the, the classic the classic male of, you know, the provider-protector type, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I see that kind of going away to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's one thing I think I mentioned in a previous podcast, but Andrew Tate brought up about when he was living in Romania. It was like, if you live in Romania, they can drink. Very Christian country, mostly Orthodox, practicing. And they can drink, but you never see a drunk girl on the street because 
it's not allowed. Not legally, but the family won't allow it. Right. And he was like, you know, I remember he was like, he was like, I was 24 years old, 25 years old, something like that. Professional fighter. And I took a girl out on a date and her, her dad sat me down before I could take her out and says, you will have her back by 1030. Yeah. He's like, and it was not an option. Uh -huh. But you're right. And you, you see, I think, that weird dichotomy. Because I think you do see sort of like the whole, like, you know, like was brought out by um, some of the Antifa, Black Lives Matter movement stuff, you know, where some of their early and even later movement stuff talked about the need to abolish the nuclear, nuclear family. family. Yep. And, you know, and I remember thinking about that. I'm like, whoa, that is like completely anti-Catholic church. Yeah. Because we see the nuclear family as, quote, the domestic church. Right. Their their approach was more like it takes a village. Right. The, the community will raise the child sort of thing. And that's helpful. Like, you know, I that's mean. That's a nice sort of safety net, but it shouldn't be the primary way a child is raised. Exactly. Yeah. You know, but I think I think the you know I'm glad you brought up the example with Tate meeting with the with the dad and said bring her back by 10:30. I think that goes hand in hand with an increasing trend I'm seeing of people just not wanting to say no or put their foot down or have a boundary with something. Right. Oh yeah. Nobody. Nobody wants to be the one that's to say no. That's wrong. Right. Because or, people won't like them for that. Right. Yeah. And again, I think that goes back to what I've said in homilies many times. The most dangerous phrase I hear in modern society is speak your truth. Right. Right. Like, no, no, truth, truth is a thing. Stuff exists. This pencil is either sharp or it's not. It's going to write or it's not. That knife is either going to be sharp and cut this meat or it's not. Right. Things exist. Truth is real. Right. Objective reality is objective reality. Right. But you're right. We live in a culture and a society that does not like that these days. Right. Because it's, uh, you know, they say it's patriarchal or right. authoritarian, you know. Or, you know, how dare you, like, question my way of living? What makes me happy? Right. Right. You know, like, recently I had a conversation with one of my cousins. And don't get me wrong. I love my cousin. I love her to death. You know, truly, from the bottom of my heart, I love her. But her husband's in prison. Actually, what, well, technically county. He's not in prison. He's serving less than an 18 month sentence, so he's in county. <laughs> get that, you know, you don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't Technicality. Wanna, technicalities. <laughs> I don't wanna get shade here. But, you know, but like I was talking to her, she's like, oh yeah, I finally started going out to the bar a little bit, you know? It took me till I was like 25, but I'm finally going to a bar every once in a while. And I'm thinking to myself, you. You gave up the right to go to the bar when you had four kids before you were 24. Yeah. Like, what? Like, again, and that can come across mean. That can come across cruel, you know? And it's not meant that way. But it's it gets back to sort of your original point about the menu is that these decisions you make have, have long-term consequence. consequences, right? right? Start having kids. You're, you're you know, you're you're obligated to sort of party less or, yeah. or not at all. Right. Know? Yeah. You know, you want to go to college and have a four year party to get a liberal arts degree. Well, like a guy that graduated college with me, he spent six years to get a liberal studies degree. And what do you do with that? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Zero. Zilch. You go into debt. Right. Or like when he got a loan repayment back, like a, like a, like a, the loan covered more than his tuition, so he got a check back at the beginning of the term. Uh -huh. He went to, we used to have a poster guy. We called him poster guy. He was there at the beginning of every semester. Uh -huh. And he had like the, you know, the hip, you know, it was like the hippie that had the posters out, you know, All right. on the green and like, you know. And he went and he blew like three, $400 on posters because he had it in his wallet. And then he was bumming food the rest of the week. I don't mean like bumming like to be mean here, but like he was, you know, he's always with it, you know, like, hey, hey, can I, can I have that pizza? Yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah fine. Yeah. Or, hey, uh, if you guys are going out, can you, uh, can you spot me? <sighs> fine. Yeah, I remember one time, actually, it was funny. Actually, it was during that semester we had him out. A bunch of us were out. 
uh, we were all 20, like 22, 23. Um, my buddy Dave, who was in the army, um, was going after this one girl, Bridget. I was going after this one friend of ours, Devin, who was a girl. <laughs> want to specify that. Because I was shocked when I found out Devin was a, not a dude when I first met the person. I'm like, hey, where's right, Devin? Yeah, Devin? I heard there's going to be a Devin here. Typically a guy's name. Right. Devin Sawa. You know, but then this other guy was out. And then he had this confused look. Him and another guy had this very confused look when the checks came. And Dave took care of Bridget and I took care of Devin. And like they were left with their checks. And I just remember looking at him like, you, you really don't, don't get it, do you? Like, <laughs> like really? Eh. <laughs> Think it through. Yeah. We're not covering you. <laughs> but again, consequences. You know, you blow your money when it's in your pocket now. What are you going to do tomorrow? Right. You right. know, you want to eat filet mignon today. Well, you might have peanut butter and jelly tomorrow. Yeah. You know, whereas, you know, if you time it out, you might not have to eat top ramen for the next three years. Right. Right. Yeah. And that. You know, we've been talking a little bit about education, and, and that's why I really think, you know, schools should offer some kind of financial literacy 101. Oh, absolutely. You know. My high school did. Yeah. My high school, I ain't going to lie, had, like, the best requirements when I was there. Because every student had to take shop. Every student had to take home ec. So, like, you learn the basics of how to weld, how to use a power tool, how to take apart a small engine, which was cool, actually. I mean, it was a pain, but you learn how to disassemble something. You learn how to troubleshoot it. You learn how to fix it, clean it, make it work again without giving up, which I think is a skill we are drastically in need of in society, how to just tinker until yeah. it works. Uh -huh. You know, again, like today, not to be mean, but one of the monks texted me today, the laptop won't turn on. I'm like, okay, what does it have? Power? Like... I, I I don't know. Did, did you check the fittings? Like like, tinker. Right. But you know, so we all had to take a home act too, which uncovered like how to balance a checkbook, how to run a budget, how to calculate what is your average cost for a meal, how much can you spend on this? Right. Where's your money going at the end of the week? Uh -huh. And also how to sew. Which again, am I the best seamstress out there? No. Can I sew a hole in a habit or in my pants? Uh -huh. Yes. Is seamstress a non-gendered term? Because it sounds like a feminine term. I think seamstress is the feminine. Maybe seamster? Seamster. <laughs> that sounds too much like teamster, though. Um, <laughs> well, seamstress sounds like mistress. Or tailor. Yeah. Tailor's probably the tailor. male. Yeah. I'd say tailor. Tailor. Well, you wouldn't say tailoress. No. Yeah. A tailor and seamstress. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. The wonders of language. Exactly. Yeah. Aren't you the English teacher? That's right. I, I think so, yes. <laughs> but no, but like, again, I think those are all things we don't think through in society. You know, like, again, like, we focus on, you know, making sure a kid can do X, Y, Z. And I'm not saying knowing history is bad. I'm not saying knowing, you know, how to do math or, you know, having advanced AP physics is bad. I think those are very good skills. But the practical skills, you need, you, need, you need practical skills just to get along in the world. Right. Yeah. But when you wake up and your battery is dead, do you know how to jump it? Right. You know what I mean? Do you know how to hook up a positive and a negative and not blow up your battery? Right. Or, you know. Well, now we have the internet for that. <laughs> Dude, don't. Yeah, no. That's a funny thing. No like, lies. You know, you used to have a math teacher who said, can I use a calculator? No. What are you always going to walk around with a calculator in your pocket? Yeah. And it's like, now we do. <laughs> now Not only is it a calculator, do. but I don't even have to type the numbers in. I exactly. can just speak it and say, what's 67 times 44, you know? Yep. Well, the square root of X, Y, Z. Yep. Yeah. Well, thinking of phones, did you uh, talk about consequences? Did you see uh, Elon Musk's counter to Apple threatening to deplatform the Twitter app? Oh, yeah, he just said, oh, I'll just create a phone. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll just make a phone because he has Starlink, yeah. which he could use for his satellites. Yeah. Right? I saw a couple uh, uh, tech guys actually point that out. They're like, what's frightening is he's one of the few people in the world right now that could pull that trigger. Yeah. That could just create an entire new 
phone infrastructure. Not just the phone, not just like reskin like a Hanway phone, but bypass even the bulk of the cellular like, network. Ch- like change the landscape of the phone game. Simply out of spite. Yeah. <laughs> that's and such a flex. That's must such be must that's gotta be such a good feeling because, you know, so often, you know, people that aren't as rich as Elon Musk, uh-huh. you know, you're maybe sometimes feel powerless to change things or right. you need more money if you want to have more influence, da da da. And he's just like, Okay, I'll just create my own phone company and just change the game. How about that? Yeah. Like <laughs> I can't buy Apple, so okay, I'll do this. Right. I'll make my own. You know, the, I'll go have my own sandbox. Or the classic, though I can't say it because the app would never approve it, the line Bender does. You know, I'll go do my own, own amusement park with blank and blank. <laughs> you know what? Forget the amusement park. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah. But, but I think there's something to be on a more basic level about Musk is you don't like it, I'm going to build a new thing. Yeah. Instead of just constantly complaining about it. Right. Right. You don't like it, build a new one. Build yeah. a better one. Do a better one. Right. If you think this thing is so bad, show me. Show me how you can do a better one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that was why, like, he demanded, like, look, you want to keep your job? Cool. Send me your top 10 pages of code that you've done in the last six months. I'm going to have my guys look at it. <laughs> you know, if this is something to be proud of, if this is like, you know, send me your best work product. Because I think that's what he's looking for. He's looking for the guys that are able to do that. Right. Cut the fat. Yep. You know, it's like uh, that, how that guy used to run GE. The yeah. bottom 10% of performers every year. See you later. Yep. You got to keep up. Yep. And he was talking about that in a video. I think we talked about this. He said, I would just walk around the halls of Twitter and see people like standing around and I say, what do you do? Or like, what are you working on? And if they didn't have an answer, I'd just say, okay, you're fired. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Which on one hand is pretty brutal. On the other hand, pretty that's just straight up <laughs> brutal. Like that's that's like Genghis Khan brutal, man. <laughs> well, Genghis Khan, I mean, but on the one hand, is it brutal? Yes. On the other hand, here's a guy running a business. Yeah. The most important thing in the business is your bottom line. Yeah. Here's a guy who has cut half, two thirds the staff, and it's still functioning. Without, right. without interruption? Yeah, someone said that because I think Twitter has had before Se- Musk had 7,000. 7, right, yeah, 7,000. And people were saying, yeah, you need that many people to run this business? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got, you know, and again, think of unintended consequences. Like, I love that you had like people like Whoopi Goldberg, etc. leave Twitter and go to Mastodon, which is a confusing system. Like, I'm not going to lie. But it was, you know, more at least thought to be more left-leaning friendly and then yesterday i think it was today i don't know time recording this i I remember seeing it you know the the head of mastodon which is this like twitter competitor put out a post saying look this isn't twitter if they're not violating the explicit community safety guidelines do not report them for violating the community guidelines you have a mute function you have a block function. Block or mute them. Do not report them. Uh-huh. Or we'll block you. And it's one of these, like, again, unintended and consequences. You think you're going to get X, and really, you end up getting Y. Uh-huh. And I think we see that even, like, in, like, even take, like, the Catholic Church. You know, you see, and that's one of the things that worries me, is, like, you see these movements of, you know, I don't want to use the term conservative or liberal, but these liturgical movements, etc. And again, I think you push one way too hard, you risk a massive counter. Right. And, you know, that worries me. Like, I know of a, a monk, not of our place, but another monk who was recently not suspended. His faculties weren't revoked. But the bishop, where he had been an administrator, contacted his abbot and said he's no longer welcome in my diocese. It wasn't revoking of the faculties formally, but it was a remove him. And it was because he's gone more conservative. You know, he 
didn't kick anybody out, but he stopped taking alter girls. He only started accepting alter boys for new. He didn't kick out the ones that were already there, but he didn't accept new ones. His response was, you know, I, I have enough men applying. And he didn't need, you know, he stopped using extraordinary ministers. And when the bishop asked him, well, why? He goes, I have two priests in this parish. I don't need them. Mm -hmm. I get 50 people for mass on a Sunday. Like, I don't need to use a lay minister. Right. Like, I got it. You know, but he was removed because, quote, his ecclesiology does not match the current church. Right. And what makes me think about the consequence of things. And I'm not saying I agree with him. I did laugh, but I'm not saying I agree with him. Was his reaction was, it's fine. They're right. But give it five years. And that got my mind thinking. Because I'm like, he might not be wrong. Because if the church does like the society does, you crack down too hard one way, you get a hard course correction sometimes. Right. Sometimes it takes 20 years, but sometimes you get a hard course correction. And I think we're going to see that in entertainment, you know. Uh... Oh, yeah. Well, look at the movies. Maverick, you know, Top Gun, Maverick. Right. There's been this swing among some studios of, you know, movies with a more uh, a political uh, message behind it or uh, some kind of uh, political bent to it. And people, I think, are kind of getting tired of it. And oh, we yeah. see that with some of the recent movies that come out. I think the newest animated Disney movie that came out lost a lot of money. Yep. And uh, uh, you've seen that with, uh, I think... I think Hillary Clinton was supposed to have some kind of show on. Oh no, there was supposed to be some kind of show on Netflix about a a pregnant man. Like he was the he was the, the he's main pregnant. Character. He's expecting. He's expecting. He's expecting. And people like revolted over that, and they removed yeah. it and da da da. And uh, I think people are getting a little tired of sort of being preached to. Right. With, well, look at entertainment. Look at the Black Panther. You know, Wakanda Forever. You know, it's making money. But it's not making Black Panther money. And again, if you read some of the stuff, you know, like the sheer fact that the CEO of Disney, you know, got the axe and they brought back... Um, what's Bob Iger. Yeah. Says, like, I think they're starting to realize, like, okay. Then you have, you know, outlets like the Daily Wire coming mm -hmm. up to try to f sort of... Uh, almost like uh, uh, fit themselves into this little... A uh, 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 window that these yeah. major major studios have left. Yeah, right. They're all about you know kid friendly programming and yeah. uh, uh, movies uh, that are more about just entertaining you or yeah. maybe even have some kind of a Christian message behind it, Judeo Christian message yeah. behind it. Um, and they're blown up. Look, and and again that creates backfires. Look at um, we're doing a podcast. You know, um, Ben Shapiro went to that podcast convention in Texas or whatever. Right. And he had sent the Daily Wire as a team, but he went in as just a, a guest, you know, because uh, the Daily Wire, I think, as a as a distro for podcasts, because you have Matt Walsh, Candace Owens, all those people. I think it ranks like fourth in the world behind like Amazon, Spotify, and Google. Might be fifth in huh. Apple. But it's like as a distro, if you counted that as an, it's like in the top five globally for podcast distribution. Uh-huh. And, you know, because Ben Shapiro went and one of the attendees who had like 1,500 followers said that they felt unsafe by his presence there. Right, yeah. Just because he was there. Not because he said anything, not because he addressed them, not because he said something derogatory, just because of his presence. Maybe the least intimidating person physically on the planet. Right. <laughs> they... They basically, you know, the, this organization, this convention sent out this like very big formal apology to this person, da, 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 saying like basically throwing Ben Shapiro under the bus. So I love Ben's response. He's like, okay, then we're done with you. I don't need you. Right. And he followed through with it. Yeah. And I think you're seeing more and more of that in a lot of stuff. Right. The... Culture pushes too far in one direction, whether it's conservative or liberal. You then see people go, all right, you know what? I'm done with you. Yeah. 
again, like take take Elon Musk. Like I remember like six months ago, eight months ago, people were yelling at him, you know, like, we used to be a liberal. Why aren't you with us? And he's like, my politics have not changed. You moved the bar to the point where I'm now considered a conservative. Right. You're right. And if people like Elon Musk and Bill Maher are saying that, right, the goalposts have moved too far. Right. Yeah. But again, unintended consequences. Yeah. You cater to one thing, you focus too heavily on one thing, and you get unintended consequences. You know, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of like, you know, even with like taking care of yourself personally, mm -hmm. right? If you're so concentrated on one thing, say, uh, you know, say you're a family man and you, you, you put too much emphasis on your job, right? Right. Your personal relationships start to suffer, your social relationships, yeah. your social life. So this got, it gets back to the idea of, you know, it's Benedictines and in the rule of rule of St. Benedict talk a lot about balance. Oh yeah. Well, that's one thing. I know somebody that basically destroyed their engagement. They're working seven days a week. Their fiance is like, look, I'd like to be able to see you and not have you just be asleep on a couch. So cut back on the hours a little bit. And they were very hard headed and the, no, no, no. I want to be able to pay for the wedding. I want to get a house. I want to get this. I want to get this. I want to get this. I want us to have a good life together in a year or two. And they didn't listen to the fiance. And the fiance stepped out. And then it became a big thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. But again, the the need for balance, the need for avoiding the extremes. Like Benedict says, you can't go one way or the other, like too haphazard. In fact, in, I think it's in the recommendation for the abbot. It says, you know, that you should never elect an abbot who's prone to extremes because of that danger. And yeah, again, I just think as a society, we need to focus on realizing the risk of our consequences and also to develop the skin to be able to deal with them. You know, if I, I think back to like my, you know, dad's generation, grandfather's generation, and even earlier, like the World War II generation, etc., they understood the consequences of their stuff and they just, they dealt with it. They you know, they chose their life. They went with it. Like, I remember mowing the grass at my aunt's and a uh, distant cousin of mine, but a cousin of mine, you know, was talking and his granddaughter was getting a divorce. And I was like, oh, these young ones don't, don't realize it anymore. You know, you, you make your vows and you made them. You're stuck with them. Doesn't mean you're always going to like the person you're sleeping next to, but you made your vows. You figure out a way to make it work. Right. At which point his wife, who was like three yards away, and goes, you know, you weren't always a peach either, husband. <laughs> and, you know, that's part of making a lifelong commitment is that there are moment, there are times where it's going to be hard, long stretches where it's going to be difficult. Yep. But that's not necessarily a sign that you made the wrong decision or that you should break that commitment. No, it's a sign that you should find a way to fix it, if right. possible. Right. Again, that doesn't mean there's always a way. Even the Catholic Church and the Canons of Trent said, look, though we might not give you a divorce, the church reserves the right to say, y'all can't live together anymore as husband and wife. Right. I mean, you're getting remarried. It just means you and you will not live in the same roof because you're going to kill each other. Right. I think, you know, just think back to the, the passion. You know, mm -hmm. Jesus had a commitment to God and to following God. Yep. And at any point, he could have said, I don't want to do this anymore. Yep. That human part of him mm -hmm. said, you know what? This is just too much. Yep. You know? Peace, I'm out. But he didn't He didn't do that. Yep. But yeah. Well, we're coming up on time. we got about a minute left before an hour. But I do kind of want to leave on one like final unintended consequence that did hit me. And I think it'll shock some people if they actually make it this far and listen. <laughs> it hit me Sunday. I was listening to the homily. I con celebrated mass. I was back home with the folks. Think about the Our Father. All right? And what we pray for. It dawned on me. If we got family, relatives, etc., who are living completely against the church's teachings, completely against, like they're living in a state of mortal sin, and we know it. When we pray the Our Father, we're praying for them to burn in hell. Unintended consequence. 
And we'll see you next week. <laughs> well, because think about it. We pray for thy kingdom come. It's season of Advent. Aveniat regnum tuum. Thy kingdom come. As it on earth, as it is in heaven. We pray for the end of the world. And if you die in a state of mortal sin, in the eyes of the Catholic Church, where do you go? Right. That hit me hard. A bad place. Right. Yeah. But I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. well, I don't know. But are you praying for their demise, or are you just praying for the kingdom to come, and that is just a side effect of the kingdom coming? That's the side effect. That's the right. unintended consequence. Right, unintended consequence. Right. And again, that that's my brain's been seeing this all week. Yeah, yeah. But huh. anyway, on that happy note. Anyway, hell. See you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, we're at about an hour. Um, hope you like this again. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Um, see you next week, I believe. And again, it's been Father Demetrius and Brother Will. Have a good one, guys. Peace. Peace. <laughs>